So, um, hello everybody. I can have a, a little view of, of a part of the room. So I, I, I believe I don't see everybody, but I see a part of you. Um, and um, so we're happy to, to uh, give you this lecture. Um, I am uh, Fabien Esculier. I am a researcher at Ecole des Ponts uh, in Paris. And I'm really sorry that I cannot attend physically today. Uh, we tried hard to find a moment when, we, when it would be possible, but we didn't manage to find any, sorry. Um, and uh, I was glad to give a lecture uh, last year at uh, EPOG. I had very good memory of this moment uh, with uh, last year's uh, students. Um, it was a nice uh, exchange. Uh, we were talking about planetary boundaries last year. That, that's what I was asked to 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 talk about. Um, it will not be the, the the subject of what I will talk about uh, today because um, the discussion was much more intense on other aspects, and uh, I was asked to give a, a focus on on the things that that uh, seem to be the most interesting for for you. So I will talk more about um, the program that I'm coordinating at the moment, which is called the OKP program. It's an action, action research program uh, focusing on, on the question of food excreta systems. And um, what I will, I'll try to talk uh, about today, thank you for the camera that, that enables me to see who, uh, who the people are, is, um, is this, the different strategies that we can think about uh, for uh, global ecological and social uh, transformation of our societies, especially, especially focused on the question of uh, what I call the food excreta systems, and which I will um, explain a little bit more uh, in, in a few minutes. Um, so if I'm not mistaken, you are from a little bit all around the world, uh, and you are following these lectures of the EPOG uh, program. You are a bit more focused, I think, on, on social science than, than um, uh, globally. Um, so if ever you don't understand me, if ever um, my level of speech or what I talk about is not clear, uh, please uh, ask me and don't hesitate also to raise your hands. I mean, I will not possibly be able to see who is raising your hand, but uh, I believe Pierrick on site can help me. Um, so that you can, uh, of course, ask questions if you want. And um, the main idea is to keep at least a, a big half an hour, three quarters of an hour at the end to have a debate. So I, I have I have slides at the beginning. You can interrupt me, but uh, uh, we'll have time to debate also uh, uh, at the end. So. Um, so what I will talk about is. Um, Try, first, I'll try to reframe the question of the wastewater management. Uh, that's the topic I, I, I'm a specialist of. Um, the wastewater management issues uh, with the perspective of the Anthropocene era in which we are now. Uh, I'll give a few lessons from history. Uh, I think it's a very uh, useful insights on all the questions that we that we have about our future is to study, uh, study the past, uh, of course. I'll talk a little bit about what the new regime of Anthropocene changes uh, today in, in the way that we can uh, frame this peculiar problem of wastewater management. And I'll talk about the current French dynamics uh, and multi-level strategies for socio-ecological transitions, which I believe is quite in the heart of what you are aiming at in the EPOG uh, uh, master's uh, degree. So why am I here today? Um, I often try to understand how I came to be uh, so much involved and interested into these environmental questions. And I, I think that I can trace it to when I was young and when my parents uh, brought me to go in the mountains and walking. I like it very much because it's very cheap. Anybody can go uh, and walk. Uh, uh, I mean, anybody. Many people can have the, the chance to go uh, to go out and, and, and walk and hike for, for a few days. I hope you do have this opportunity. And when you go hiking, you are in direct contact with the environment. And I think one of the biggest issues that we have today is this disconnection between the people and what makes enables us to live, uh, our environment in general. Uh, we have more than half of the population on the world that is urban. And urban urbanites are characterized by this inflow of matter of things that come to your house. You you just have to open a tap, and water will flow automatically. 
And as soon as you start walking and having to think about where does my water come from? What do I carry on my back? What do I really need? Which is a very important question. Uh, then things change radically. For example, I have never met any hiker who is walking with 150 kilograms of water in, in his back. Whereas in Paris, where you are now, uh, there is uh, about 150 kilograms or liters of water that is consumed every day by everybody. Uh, so it's a good way to start to feel the materiality of what we use. Whereas when you live in the city, you just don't realize that the flows of the matter that, that, that go uh, when, you, when you open the tap, for instance. Um, since I was uh, passionate about the question of water, I became um, I had the chance to become head of the water uh, police department for the River Seine. So I was in charge of um, authorizing and controlling um, the use of the water, the discharges of, of water in this river. And you can see here a picture of one of the one of the worst events that took place in the last decade. That was a, a huge uh, fish mortality in the River Seine. After, after a storm. So that was what I was in charge of uh, between 2009 and 2013. And uh, when I was there, uh, there was a political decision uh, to make the Greater Paris Project. What is the main idea? The idea is that we are in a globalized world where you have huge cities. Paris is 10 million inhabitants. And at that time, the government decided 10 million is not enough. We need to be bigger, more attractive, competitive, and all, all that you like. Um, and uh, the Greater Paris was the idea of making Paris bigger. But uh, there was a question of resource. And the government asked to uh, my um, department, uh, not only the water police department, but the general environment department for the region, is it possible to make the Greater Paris? Is it possible in terms of resource, in terms of water? Are we going to have enough energy, enough material for building what we want to build? Is there going to be enough food? Uh, are we going to be able to manage the waste, transportation, and so on and so forth? And I was part of a work group that was working specifically on the question of water and sanitation. And what this group said is that, OK, if you look at the River Seine, you could have the feeling that we have a big river on which you possibly have already had the chance to, uh, to have a ride on a boat. Uh, you see this beautiful picture of, of the Seine. What people usually don't know is that it's an artificial lake. Um, here you can see a picture of Paris in the summer 1942. During World War II, um, the, there were damages on the on the on the River Seine, so they they had to uh, they had to to make the dam uh, that enables to have all the time five or six meters of water. They have to they had to to make to to make the dam go horizontal, and you could see what the Seine looks like. So in the summer, you can cross by foot. And today we have what, 10 million inhabitants living on this very little stream of water uh, that seems plentiful, but is in fact uh, so, uh, so little. And why is it problematic? Well, it's problematic for the question of quantity of water that we can take from it, of course, but also the main way that we manage uh, our wastewater is by dilution. So we flush the toilet, it goes to the sewer, and then we send it to the river uh, through a wastewater treatment plant. But the, as you can see on the picture, the wastewater treatment plant doesn't treat everything. So we need the dilution of the water. That's the way we manage pollution, is dilution of pollution, so that it, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't cause too much of a problem. Now, if the, if the, the water is uh, scarce, then this question of dilution doesn't work anymore. And the bad news of climate change is that we already have less water in the River Seine than we had a century ago because climate change is already here and it's already hotter now. And uh, it's going to be uh, even worse in the coming decades uh, because of the climate change that is uh, um, going uh, faster and faster uh, nowadays. So we, we did this work group I was part of in 2012 uh, said that there was a scissor effect. You have uh, more people with the Greater Paris you have less water in the River Seine. And today we are not managing to reach a good ecological status of the river. So it's going to be even more difficult to reach it in the future. Whereas we want to consume less energy and emit less greenhouse gas effects uh, to uh, achieve this better management of wastewater. And at the same time, now people want to swim in the Seine, as you know, for next year for the Olympic Games. So that this kind of an enormous... Uh, um, uh, will to do uh, much more, but at the same time consume much less. And the price of wastewater management has has risen 
very much in the past uh, in the past years, which makes it very uh, difficult to 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 keep on uh, in this trajectory and even impossible to reach a good ecological status of the river with the Greatest Paris project. So at that time, um, I was. Um, I, I was head of the water police department, as I said, and uh, when we gave the report saying, okay, we don't know how to make work this uh, this Greater Paris project and at the same time uh, achieve the environmental goals that we have in terms of water quality of the River Seine, uh, what we have as, as an answer is the usual answer at the political level. It doesn't work. It doesn't matter. We'll keep on with the project. So uh, I was a bit confused. Um, because, um, I mean, it's quite classical in terms of environmental topics. Uh, you, you, you have many uh, governments who, who keep on uh, doing uh, what is not environmentally sustainable. And at that time, uh, I, I was a bit confused and I wanted to see if I could do something that could be not necessarily at scale because it's so difficult to be at scale, but at least having a little bit more the feeling that what I would do uh, would be in the in the direction of of answering these uh, these e these issues, and so I I, I launched a, a research program uh, to try to think about this problem and and reframe it and try to understand how we could better uh, manage it. And it's called the the OCAPI program. And the chance I have is that ten years later, uh, it has become quite a big uh, research program that I'm managing now. And um, uh, I'm, I'm lucky enough that uh, I'm still working as a researcher and on action research, which means that I'm constantly uh, trying to deal with um, operational actors in order to, to try and, and empower and uh, enable the implementation of a radical change that we are working on in terms of wastewater uh, management. So what is, the, what is the, the, the big deal in a few, in a few minutes? I'll try to, to summarize the question. So um, why do we have wastewater? We have wastewater, um, mostly what wastewater is made of is water and uh, human urine and fecal matter. And the main matter, uh, if you can, if you want to have a, a look at what is polluting the water is uh, nitrogen, which is uh, summarized with the letter N. So we need to eat uh, 3.5 kilograms of nitrogen every year. That is a need for our human body. We eat it in the form of protein. So you have protein in the bread, you have protein in meat, in milk, in peas, in, in a little bit everything. And then uh, we excrete these 3.5 kilograms of nitrogen, but not in the same form and uh, not as proteins. We uh, excrete it in the form of urea and mainly in urine. So the main uh, uh, um, goal of a wastewater management system is to manage this nitrogen so as it doesn't pollute the water. How does it work in an ecosystem? Um, in ecosystem, nitrogen is mostly recycled. You have, uh, you have two types of, of um, uh, living beings. You have the plants, and the plants are uh, um, taking the nitrogen from the soil in a mineral form and they transform it into an organic form, into a living organism, uh, into proteins. And then you have animals. The animals will eat the proteins from the, from the plants, and then they will excrete it in the form of urine, which will go to the soil uh, in the form of urea. And then the urea will be taken up by other plants. And so the cycle goes round and round. And this is the, this is the, the classical way that the nitrogen is, uh, is working in ecosystems. Now. If you want to have a look at how it works in our society, one of the first uh, works I did in OKP Research Action Program was to uh, have a picture of the nitrogen flows in the food excreta system of Paris. Um, it is quite the same in, in most industrial society societies today. Uh, so I counted by kilogram of nitrogen per person and per year how these uh, um, nitrogen how this nitrogen flows in our society. So uh, we focused on, on human metabolism because it's a basic need of every human being. And uh, what you can see is that we eat uh, nearly five kilograms of nitrogen per person per year, which is 50% uh, more than our phys physiological need. So there is here a first big difference between what we need and what we actually uh, do in terms of, of, of uh, eating. And then you find uh, as excretions the same nitrogen uh, with the same amount of nitrogen, five kilograms of nitrogen in our excretion. If you go a little bit upwards, 
you find that we put 21 kilograms of synthetic nitrogen on the fields in the in the in terms of fertilizers which makes it very low efficiency uh, only 25 uh, percent of it is is actually uh, transformed into into food and on the other side when we flush the toilet it goes to the sewer into the wastewater treatment plants and you have sludge that is uh, boo in french that you get to that you take from these uh, wastewater treatment plants, but these sludge don't contain uh, nearly nothing in terms of nitrogen. Only five five percent of what was at the entrance. So it shows that our system is very linear, very intensive, and uh, it costs a lot of energy. On one side, we are uh, synthesizing um, uh, artificial nitrogen. Uh, uh, to put on the soil and after excretion we have natural fertilizers in the form of urine that is destroyed in the wastewater treatment plant because it's the only way that we found that we could manage this nitrogen and that as an engineer that's what I discovered when I was doing my studies in 2006 and I thought it's not possible to have a system where you synthesize um, uh, um, fertilizers with energy and then you use the same amount of energy to destroy the natural uh, fertilizers that you excrete uh, uh, every day. So that, that's the point from which I started to have my reflection on, on the topic. And of course, um, I was also very much um, impressed by the pollution that is that is due to this uh, the way that it works, because all the nitrogen that is not uh, used in the system goes in terms of pollution uh, to the air, to the water, uh, to the rivers and to the groundwater both at the food level, uh, food system level, and in terms of management of our excreta. Uh, the impacts of, of this management are quite well known. I believe you have heard about, about dead zones in the sea, where you have algae blooms, uh, dead fish. This is all caused by this excess nitrogen that is put in the, in, on, on the soil or in the water. Um, and that brings uh, all these problems. And in France, you have every week one well that is closed because there is not uh, there is too much nitrogen in the water in the form of nitrates, and that makes the water non-drinkable for the for the population. So it's a it's a very um, strong problem that is considered uh, um, at risk not only at local scale but at global scale also. And it also causes emissions of greenhouse gas in the form of N two O. Uh, it's a powerful uh, greenhouse gas that is uh, implied in all reactions uh, concerning nitrogen. So why do, why have we shifted to that kind of of, um, of system? Mainly because uh, uh, the Haber-Bosch process was invented in the beginning of 20th, 20th century. This Haber-Bosch pr process is a process that enables to take the nitrogen from the air. Um, you may know that 80% of our air is composed by nitrogen. But this, this nitrogen is not reactive. We, we cannot use it. The plants cannot use it either. And uh, in, uh, in big, in big uh, plants uh, with high amounts of energy, uh, this nitrogen can be transformed in a form that is uh, available for plants, fertilizers, and that's how it works uh, uh, today. In uh, 1924, a few years after the process was invented, an American uh, biologist named Lotka uh, said that we were entering a new uh, geological era. If you look at the amount of nitrogen that is uh, circulating today on planet Earth, uh, we have now twice the amount of nitrogen that is uh, on our planet Earth due to the introduction of this reactive nitrogen from the fertilizers and Aberbosch process. And this has happened only in the last decades and it's part of this great acceleration and transformation of our, of our, of our planet. Uh, you probably know about the planetary boundaries. Um, um, so uh, it, it explains that um, the system, the, the, the planetary system is stable due to uh, multiple parameters and that the way that the humankind is uh, modifying our environment uh, shifts our planet to uh, other states where its stability is not guaranteed at all. Uh, so we know a lot about the, the climate change, of course, uh, impact. And today, the Stockholm um, uh, Research Center uh, has uh, lately um, uh, evaluated that six of the nine planetary boundaries are already transgressed. And of these, we have novel entities, climate change, biodiversity, land system change, fresh, fresh water change, 
and biogeochemical flows of N and P. So P stands for phosphorus and N for nitrogen. So um, the question of the wastewater management in Paris is part of this uh, uh, bigger issue of uh, respecting the planetary boundaries at the, at the global scale. Um, I want to be sure that I am understandable when I when I explain all this. I hope it's not too technical. Um, if anybody has a question, please don't hesitate to uh, to ask me. Yes, I see a hand, and Pierrick, tell me if there are other hands uh, risen because I don't see them. Um, it's it's not so much about the topic as hand, but I was just curious. What was novel entities again? What was sorry? What was novel entities? Uh, oh, in novel the entities boundaries? in this planetary boundaries. So novel entities, they are also called uh, xenobiotics. It's all the entities that do not exist on planet Earth naturally and that um, chemical industry has produced. And so uh, we know that humankind has introduced uh, hundreds of thousands of novel entities in the environment. Uh, for example, right now, a lot of people are talking about PFAS. You probably heard about them. So that's the kind of entities that we have introduced in the environment that causes environmental uh, detrimental effects. And um, there has been an article that was about last year, I think, uh, that has considered that the amount of novel entity that has been introduced is in such huge uh, quantities and with so such huge impact that it's considered as a transgression of the planetary boundaries. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> Okay, I, I, I'll keep on if it's clear for everybody. Um, if you, I believe you already knew about the planetary boundaries. I don't know if you know about the donut economy also. I like this, this framework very much. Um, I see everybody nodding, so I will not go deeper uh, into it, but I find it an, an important uh, issue. Uh, and of course, the question of uh, inequality um, makes, the, makes the question of uh, uh, ecological uh, uh, issues uh, largely intertwined with the social questions. Um, and maybe you haven't seen this diagram before. Um, so just to say that uh, there are no developed countries or developing countries, as people usually say, I, I hate this terminology. I, I think that all countries today are developing countries, because here you see the countries that have been classified by ONU et al as those that that transgress the, the planetary boundaries here on the um, horizontal axis. Sorry, I will um, I will try to uh, use my laser so you can see it up here. Uh, here, the, the countries are classified uh, with the amount of biophysical boundaries transgressed, and here the social threshold that are achieved. And so what we can see is that they are uh, grossly two kinds of countries, the countries that have low environmental impact, but low uh, social achievements. And here you have countries that have high social achievements, but very high uh, environmental impacts. So of course, everybody wants to be here, uh, low uh, uh, biophysical impact and high uh, social achievement, but there's absolutely no country in this uh, magical square. Uh, so everybody needs to shift either to go upwards this way or to go um, leftwards uh, this way for the, the countries, the, the rich countries, I would say. Um, now, uh, what can we learn from history on this question of uh, nitrogen, um, food and excreta management of, of wastewater? Um, I, I, I like very much the, the, the 19th century, which I have uh, studied a lot. And it's a period during which um, I, I call it the era of circularity. Uh, for example, in Eastern Asia, uh, here you have a picture of, of a, a picture. You have a drawing of, uh, of uh, Japan. It's also something that was very common in China. Uh, you have um, a heavy use of human excreta as a fertilizer because, as I mentioned, in the ecosystem, it's the same with the, ex the excreta of, of cows, of pigs, of, of, uh, of poultry, and so on. Um, human excreta are fertilizers, and in Asia, in Eastern Asia particularly, there was tremendous uh, organization uh, about uh, returning to the soil, uh, human excreta. There was even a name in Chinese. Uh, so for those who read Chinese, you can read uh, Jin Zhe Hong. Uh, this means the business of the golden juice. 
And that's the way it was called, uh, the business of uh, urine and fecal matter at that time. I like the, the Chinese uh, way of calling this, uh, this business. Uh, as you can see with the little uh, um, plush that I have behind me, uh, you can see that it's my job and we're going to have fun for uh, the one and a half hour that we have talking about pee and poo. You don't have this occasion so often, so I, I hope you'll be happy to share uh, the joy I have to work on this topic every day. Uh, and uh, and talk about uh, Jin Jehong. Um, at that uh, at that time in the 19th century, uh, the, the the circularity in management of, of pee and poo was not only Asian. I mean, Asia or Asia was far ahead from other countries at that time. But uh, slowly, uh, every country uh, nearly adopted this circularity of human excreta, and particularly France in the 19th century has uh, uh, many uh, shifts in the way that human, human urine and fecal matter are managed in the cities. Um, and um, uh, nearly all city has developed a, a way to manage these uh, human excreta so as they could return to the agricultural soil and be used as productive fertilizer. My colleague uh, Emmanuel Atler uh, defended his thesis uh, three years ago. And he listed 200 French patents in the 19th century that was that were talking about human excreta management. So it was really a, a high question and a high uh, uh, topic of innovation in terms of how can we best manage these fertilizers so as they can be uh, used as a resource. Uh, this and this enthusiasm was uh, worldwide, and I I I have here two uh, American advertisements. Uh, talking about poudrette, it's the French word that, that was used to, to call what you, the dry matter that you can take from, from urine and fecal matter, uh, that shows that it was a, a worldwide, uh, worldwide uh, um, uh, enthusiasm. What I would try to do maybe, um, if you leave me enough time, so you'll give me the name of each of the countries that you come from, and I'll ask my historian colleagues so that they can give me advertisements and, and documentation about how uh, returning to the soil uh, of these matter was important in your different countries. And in some countries, it hasn't stopped. Uh, I mean, in France, it's nearly not the case anymore. But there are many countries where these practices still exist. Uh, and we can, of course, don't, don't even have to go to the 19th century to find places where this economy of, of uh, human urine and fecal matter is, uh, is active. And I mean, not always working perfectly, but uh, at least still um, manage in the sense of returning to the to the agricultural soils. Um, what is, I'll, I'll make it very short, but what was the story of Paris uh, concerning human excreta recycling? It was more or less the same story for uh, most of the Western world. Um, and here um, I'm going to show a graph with the nitrogen recycling rate of human excreta. So here, you have the amount of nitrogen that is returned to the soil from what the human, the people in Paris excreted from 1840 to uh, today. Uh, it's a study I did with, with the Sabine Barle uh, in 2019. So in the middle of the 19th century, um, it's not yet um, the it's not yet the 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 peak of the industrial revolution. And the habits of managing human excreta was, were very bad in Paris. There was very low recycling, recycling, but still the idea was to recycle. So there was a sewer. The sewer was made to collect the rain and only the rain. And uh, the excreta was, was stored and used as fertilizers. But they were stored in cesspools um, at the bottom of the buildings. And these cesspools would infiltrate in the ground, contaminate the water, and not be recycled. So we had very low recycling rates of about 10%. But with the Industrial Revolution, there were um, improvements in the way it was managed. People wanted to valorize the resource because it gives more power, because it produces more uh, uh, more food. Uh, so each country that can valorize these resources would be more powerful. And there was a, there was a raise in this uh, percentage uh, from 10% to 20% uh, till the turn of the, of the 19th century. And um, at that moment, uh, Paris started to have, uh, to have water that was brought to the houses with piped water. So this radically changed because then people could use, as I mentioned, these 150 liters per person per day and made possible one particular object, the flush toilet. And there would be no flush toilet if you didn't have the possibility to have so much water brought to you because... Um, one person uses about 30 liters of water to flush the toilet every day. 
And at that time, when there was no um, water to be brought to the house with pipe water, people didn't carry 30 liters on their back just to flush the toilet because it didn't make sense. But it became possible with the flush toilet. And at that moment, people wanted to flush the toilet and put it in the sewer, which was totally forbidden because the sewer was going to the river, which it would pollute the river, and we would lose the fertilizing value of these excreta. So at that moment, what was uh, decided in Paris was that we could combine the, the fact that people enjoyed having a flush toilet at the house, it's comfortable, but uh, they decided to bring the sewer to the farm. So then we had sewage farms, which made it possible to combine flush toilets plus fertilization. At that moment, it enabled Paris to have up to 50% recycling rate of human excreta uh, in, the, in the very beginning of the 20th century. But right after this, you had the invention of the Ababa process, a shift from renewable to fossil resources for fertilization. And so gradually, people were becoming less and less interested of using uh, human excreta as a fertilizer, and sewer uh, gradually became started to go to the river instead of going on the farms because the sewage farm were, were not uh, were not um, uh, make made bigger, whereas the city was growing bigger and bigger. So river discharge was the main destiny of human of uh, wastewater, and since it polluted the waters, we decided to build wastewater treatment plants. But these wastewater treatment plants were mostly designed so as to destroy the resource because it's so diluted that we cannot, uh, uh, it's very difficult to get it, to catch it. And so uh, today we have sludge that come out of the wastewater treatment plants that enable uh, some recycling. But as I mentioned before, only 5% recycling, which means that for the last 200, cent uh, 200 years, we are at the moment the less in the less uh, in the smallest circular economy we have ever been concerning human excreta management. Now, um, globally, uh, I, I supervised the thesis by Paul Minier, who defended it just a month ago. Uh, globally, the, this this uh, shift in the management of human excreta went together also with uh, with an evolution in sanitary engineering, and at the beginning. Sanitary engineers were taking care about going back to the soil and sanitary safety in the management of human excreta. And gradually, uh, here, if you look at the, the document, by that is a, it, it is a, a manual for wastewater engineers in the beginning of the 20th century in the United States. Uh, you see that the people say, OK, now that we can make technologies to purify the water, we don't need to care about wastewater. Let's just uh, dump it to the rivers, and then we'll treat the water so as to use it. So. Rivers were kind of sacrificed uh, because technology could produce pure water from nearly anything. And that's the way that we, we, uh, we arrived in this kind of uh, uh, sewer management. And um, 20 years later, in 1934, they even say that if public health had some influence in the early periods on the question of sewer, finally, it's only comfort that has become the more potent incentive. So this shows, and for me, it's a tremendous, uh, of tremendous importance to take into account that comfort is the big question uh, that, that we have to face with this question of um, the Anthropocene era, uh, because uh, global change is uncomfortable. And what has uh, driven the management of, of human excreta uh, in the last century and globally the way that our society works is uh, comfort for, for a great uh, part. So that's one of the things we're going to have to negotiate in the in the coming years, uh, who uh, what what comfort uh, what 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 is comfort? What comfort do we need, and and for and for who? Um, uh, this question of um, using the waste the the sewer and the wastewater treatment plant as the management of human excreta um, poses more globally the question of why is the technique chosen by a society? And I quote. Um, my colleagues, uh, uh, Sabine Barle and Etienne Dufour, who are themselves um, uh, quoting David Noble, uh, an American researcher working on techniques. And um, he tries to answer this question of why does society choose a technique? And what I like very much in this uh, analysis, in this socio-technical analysis, is that the success or failure of a technique does not rely on the technique itself and its technical or economical efficiency, seldom confirmed, but on the cultural values, the leading ideas, and the power relationships in the society. So if we want to shift to a sustainable uh, circular management of human excreta, it is 
not uh, uh, only a technical question. It is, of course, a technical question, but it's mostly a question of cultural values and power relationships of how are we going to decide to have our world uh, working and can we arrive to a, a compromise in a, in a, for a sustainable world, which is, I mean, the main issue and one of the main issues that we have to, to face uh, today and that you are studying in your, in your great uh, epoch, uh, a master. Um, so what does the new uh, regime of the Anthropocene change? Um, uh, I, I mentioned the transgression of the planetary boundaries. It changes uh, everything. I mean, this is the commitment that we have signed all countries in the IPCC agreement of uh, the Paris Agreement of, of uh, COP 15, uh, COP uh, 21 in 2015. Uh, we have agreed that we are going to have this uh, decline of greenhouse gas emission that is quite uh, vertical, as you can see in the figure, but that's what we have all um, agreed to do. Uh, of course, it's going to be difficult. Um, and we can say that um, either we don't uh, manage to do it, either if we do, then it's going to be very tough to have it with social uh, uh, peacefulness uh, because it's so abrupt. Uh, so, of course, we need to think of what is the best way that we can act. So as we go as close as possible to these figures of, of uh, greenhouse gas uh, reduction in the coming uh, years. But, um, I mean, I appreciate a lot the fact that uh, seriousness has changed aside. aside. It's, a, it's a, a sentence I heard from uh, Aurélien Barraud, a French uh, astrophysician and philosopher, um, and that I really have myself uh, um, um, felt in the last uh, decades. I mean, 20 years ago, it was quite um, uh, impossible to say that we had to change radically our society. And now I really feel that seriousness has changed sides. So it's, I mean, the people who are considered uh, fools are not the ones who say that we have to make radical changes, but those who, who say that business as usual will, will make it possible to, to face these changes. So um, we are not in the, we, we have had a period of heroic uh, whistleblowers in the 20th century. I'm thinking of people like Rachel Carson, for, for example. Um, and now uh, that the landscape is shifting anyways, because we have extreme climate events, depletion of fossil fuels, um, there's no other way than to negotiate the Western way of life and find, find ways to resist the disaster. And we can talk about it. I mean, I'm, I'm quite happy to have the occasion now to, to say it quite frankly, because I found it very difficult to talk about 10 years ago, at least even if the changes are not... Um, uh, taking place, at least we can have the debate and talk about it clearly now that everybody has signed the uh, IPCC document saying that we need to do this, to do this shift um, uh, very quickly and with radical changes. Um, so for my question of wastewater management, um, then the way that I propose to reframe the question of how should we manage uh, human excreta is, is, is such. Now, now that sewer management is uh, considered both economically, sanitarily, environmentally, and socially inefficient, which is the conclusion of most of our works in the OCAPI program, but comfortable at the scale of a building, uh, as I mentioned before, the two questions I would like to debate with you in the, in the coming hour is what are the alternative management of human excreta that enable to respect planetary boundaries and social justice? And uh, how do they interact with the global shift in human society organization in the Anthropocene? So it's an intertwined question of, of social and technical aspects um, that I work on with, the, with, with our team, that we work on in our team at, at OKP program, and that I'll be glad to share in the coming, uh, in the coming hour. Um, are there any, any questions about um, what, I, what I just mentioned? I hope I'm clear. I don't talk too fast and... Um, I'm understandable for you. Yeah, I see thumbs up. Great. <laughs> it's always tough when you're not on site. Uh, I'm sorry not to be here physically uh, to, to see how, 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 how good you, you, you understand me. And I hope I, it's interesting for you. Um, so as I see your thumbs up, I'll, I'll keep on. Um, so what is the state of the current French dynamics on the question of uh, alternative uh, human excreta management? So um, thinking that we could do something else than the sewer was considered not a serious topic in the, two, in the years 2000 um, when I was a student. Um, there was nothing in public policy, policies or in, in the regulations 
there was no academic research on the topic of doing something else than the sewer to manage human excreta. As I mentioned, there was, no, uh, there is a, a there was a strong uh, socio-technical locking. I believe you are all familiar with the question of a uh, socio-technical locking, and there is a huge path path dependencies. I mean, once you've built the sewer, then it's much easier to connect new people to the same sewer, as we have uh, discussed in an article by uh, Aurélie Jovenot uh, and colleagues. And as I mentioned uh, before, there is this huge disconnection between uh, urbanites and agriculture that has been built in the last uh, decades in our societies. And even a cultural problem, um, and not even, but mostly a cultural problem, uh, because the question of managing our human excreta is usually uh, not something people think about. And I, I like to quote um, this answer that, uh, that I had one day from a person about which I was talking about the fact that when we use a flush toilet, we, we, we pollute the rivers. And the person I, I told this, she said, Oh, but I don't poo in water. And I mean, it's like the the person didn't make a relationship between the water that was in the toilet, that's kind of a technical water, and the water from the river, that is kind of the natural water. And I mean, there's such a disconnection that she was she was not even realizing that that peeing and pooing every day in the water of her toilet had a link with the pollution of the river that was flowing just uh, uh, in the, in the city where she was living. And for me, this is a, a strong cultural problem that is a worldwide problem of our uh, uh, the question of our the relationship between the human beings and their uh, daily uh, excretions. It of course depends a lot on the country, the, the culture, uh, uh, the social. Uh, it's a, it's a highly uh, social uh, question, but globally. Um, there is a there is a, a a strong cultural problem, especially in Western countries, of the way that we uh, interact with our human excretion. But in the years two thousand, they started to be uh, to have a, a social movement, and a, a, a small professional sector on the question of alternative management of human excreta that started to be united in what, it, what is called the réseau de l'assainissement écologique, so ecological sanitation network. There is um, an equivalent at the international level, which is called SUSANA, Sustainable Sanitation Alliance. Uh, and in France, it's called the uh, Réseau de l'Assainissement Écologique. Um, with the growing of awareness of unsustainability of our societies, there has been a mutual reinforcement of the actors uh, working on this field of changing human excreta management. In 2016, uh, just after the, the work group I mentioned about the wastewater management in Paris, uh, the, wastewater, the Paris Wastewater Authority, the SIAP, uh, included source separation analysis in its uh, strategic plan. And two years later, uh, we had the end of OCAPI phases that, that can concluded on the interest for source separation, uh, which is separate management of human excreta from the sewer. And the Seine Normandie Water Agency, which is the the main uh, subsidizing um, uh, body in, uh, in France about water management, uh, decided to vote 80% subsidy for source separation projects. So th this was a huge um, uh, decision that's enabled to uh, subsidize many projects. And uh, in particular, the city of Paris decided to implement urine source separation in a more than 1,000 people district, the Saint-Vincent-Paul district in the Paris uh, 14th uh, district. Which you can go and have a visit uh, if you want. It's under construction at the moment, and it's one of the bigger pro biggest projects in France, uh, where people are considering to have uh, another management of uh, human urine and, and um, uh, to to valorize it. And there is even a, a study uh, at the moment for twenty thousand people urine collection in Saclay region. So the plateau de Saclay is just south of Paris. And it's a, a place where there's going to be new developments and where they think of implementing uh, other ways of managing uh, um, human excreta. So um, the OKP program uh, I mentioned uh, that I work for started in 2013, and we have encountered kind of a boom of the topic. And, in, and I started working in this at, at a moment when it was very difficult to talk about alternative management of human excreta in 2013-14. And right now, I have the chance to be uh, the coordinator of a, of a big program now, uh, where we are all working on these uh, uh, questions uh, in, um, in a transdisciplinary approach and, and systemic approach, uh, action-oriented, because we try to raise awareness and make links 
with uh, uh, with different uh, stakeholders in order to have uh, implementation of projects and shift in the way that we manage human excreta. And we are, are working on different aspects, uh, both um, uh, technical aspects, engineering aspects, social aspects, anthrop anthropological aspects, health aspects, and so on and so forth on, uh, on this question with a, with a, a large um, um, uh, collaboration with multiple uh, stakeholders. So what we see now is that uh, France is, um, is catching up with Northern Europe that was in advance on the question of source separation in the, in the last decade. And uh, we have now uh, uh, many different projects that have emerged where people are trying to um, implement new management of human excreta. Uh, I mentioned this Saint Vincent Paul district, which is one of the, the biggest um, uh, uh, project uh, uh, at the moment. And what they want to implement there is having uh, a urine separating toilet, so a toilet that will um, that manage to collect separately the urine. Uh, it will be uh, collected in um, to uh, and, and redirected to a small building where it will be treated for concentration because otherwise it's, it's too big volumes for the city of Paris to manage uh, downtown with the huge density of population that we have. And it's going to be uh, converted into fertilizers uh, to return to, uh, to the soil. So uh, there's going to be about 1,000 flush diverting toilets installed, uh, a collection by gravity treatment, uh, a biogravity network, uh, treatment uh, of concentration, and valorization uh, as a fertilizer. Now, um, this uh, possibility of shifting, uh, we have studied how it faces a, a, a very strong socio-technical lock-in, and um, this lock-in is, is at all levels, but mostly um, at the level of what we call the landscape. So, Globally, the, the two main uh, barriers that we identified is first the lack of knowledge. So people don't know that urine and fecal matter can be fertilizing uh, uh, materials. And uh, they are ignorance of the issue, of the problem of pollution and of the solution. So that's the first uh, thing we are trying to work on is raise awareness on the topic. And the second big issue I mentioned already is the social norms of, of hygiene and uh, attitude towards our, our bodily uh, matters. Now, um, to, to, to finish this, uh, this presentation, and before we can uh, engage into a, a, a longer discussion together, I'll try to develop uh, the ideas of multi-level strategies for socio-ecological transition on this peculiar, peculiar aspect of the management of human excreta. Um, do you have any questions or misunderstanding about what I just said before? Is everything still okay for you? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'll keep on that. Um, so how can we shift towards sustainable food excreta systems? So as I mentioned before, we need to eat uh, about 3.5 kilogram of nitrogen per person per year. And we excrete the same amount of 3.4 uh, kilogram nitrogen. Um, if we want to act for sustainable uh, systems, we have three levers, uh, levers at the diet level at the agricultural practices and in terms of management of human excreta. So I'll, I'll go fast on diets and agricultural practices, but just to mention them, uh, you can see in this graph that uh, you have here the GDP of, of all the countries in the world in a, at a logarithmic scale. And you can see on the, on the vertical axis, the per capita per, uh, uh, consumption of, of, uh, of uh, each country. And here you have the recommendation of how much uh, nitrogen we're supposed to eat. So there are some countries, uh, well, poor countries that don't have enough food for everybody to eat correctly. But you see that rich countries, uh, it's it's very well correlated, eat much too much protein because it's just a, a marker of the, of richness. And you have the uh, sorry, uh, you have France that is uh, located here in the in the in the in the group of the rich and rich countries that suffer from eating too much. Uh, as, as you already know, there's, a, there's about 1 billion people on Earth who don't have enough to eat and 1 billion people on Earth who, who die from eating too much uh, and being too rich in their, in, their, in their diets. And you can see the same trend with the question of percentage of animal protein in the human diet. So the richer the country, the more the proteins will be in the form of animal protein, which are, uh, of course, uh, consumable. Um, but um, there is uh, no reason to eat as much as it is done now in the richest country, 
and the impact, the environmental impact of eating uh, uh, animal food is much higher than vegetable food. Um, so uh, we cannot have a shift of all the countries to the Western uh, diet because it's just not sustainable concerning uh, especially the nitrogen uh, planetary boundary, planetary boundary. Um, in terms of uh, food production, um, I will uh, just quote the, the work by uh, Gilles Bilen and colleagues who have shown that we can reshape. He, he did some work also at the world, sc world scale, but here is a, it's work, work uh, done at the European scale. And um, this paper shows that Europe, for instance, uh, can totally shift to uh, biological uh, organic, sorry, um, organic agriculture. Uh, we can uh, stop uh, importation of uh, fertilizers. We can stop imports of feed for the animals. Uh, Europe can be totally aut autonomous and even export some food and feed everybody. So the main uh, conditions are to change uh, the diets, to change the way that uh, agriculture is, is managed. And lastly, to change the management of uh, human excreta, which is what I will I will talk now for the last uh, uh, 15 minutes of my uh, uh, introductory uh, speech. So, um, what can we do with with uh, with with uh, with, uh, with, uh, with with pee and poo? Well, you can do a, a plush, as is shown on this picture. That's the first way to start to uh, make people uh, uh, trying to change the way that they look at this matter, and that I'm doing with you at the moment. And then you can start to have a, a, a look at how we can act uh, for this change. So uh, first of all, um, if you look at the figures, well, what we do today when there is wastewater management is dilution. So uh, in France, uh, there is about 150 liters consumed per person per day, whereas uh, human urine is only 1.3 liter per person per day and fecal matter 0.2 uh, liters. And if you look at the material that is uh, inside, and mainly nitrogen, which is the main resource of our excretions, it's mainly in uh, in, in urine, eighty percent, ten percent more in fecal matter, and nearly nothing in uh, in what we call the grey water, so all the rest of the water. So uh, what we do mostly today is uh, dilution, and we can reconsider urine as a fertilizer. Uh, uh, by separating it from the wastewater in order to better management, manage it. So uh, that's what I did with my first uh, PhD student, uh, Tristan Martin, and with the INRAE, which is the uh, Agricultural Institution of France. Uh, we did an experiment that everybody knew about in the 19th century, but everybody had forgotten about in the 21st century, which is that urine is a fertilizer. So we um, fertilized uh, grass uh, with uh, urine, so on the left side, you can see grass that doesn't have urine. On the right side, uh, grass that has urine. So we re-demonstrated uh, the fertilizer effect of, of uh, urine. And um, of course, it's something that you can do yourself. So I, I believe the first way that we can manage uh, this socio-ecological transition is to uh, live it in our own ways of living and uh, making it real. So we are publishing a lot of uh, recommendations on OKP program website about how uh, can we manage elsewise our, our excreta. And urine is the easiest one to use. Even if you don't have uh, any uh, access to land, you always have a, at least the possibility to have a small plant uh, in, in, your, in your apartment. And if you, if you have two small plants, then you can try to fertilize one with your urine and not fertilize the other one. And you can see the difference uh, of, 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 of using it, uh, especially if you want to have uh, a lovely, uh, um, lovely plants uh, in, your, in your apartment, then you, you'd better uh, fertilize them with your urine, but not too much, of course. And only a very little bit of it is, is necessary. And you, you can find in, on this document all the information you need about uh, the quantities and the way to apply in urine in a, in a, safe, uh, in a safe way. Uh, sorry. Yeah, um, there's a lot of devices that have been developed uh, to collect urine. You can see here um, a dry male urinal. So it's a urinal, but without the flush toilet to make it possible to collect the urine uh, uh, separately. Here's a dry, uh, separating toilet with flush toilet. Here's another one without flush. This is also a, an interesting uh, device developed by a French company uh, that enables to collect the liquids here. And then the, the fecal matter will stay on, on this conveyor belt, and the conveyor belt will bring the fecal matter uh, behind to, to a box. It's quite an, 
a, a clever system that works quite well. Here is the latest um, urine separating toilet that had been developed uh, by uh, the Laufen company in 2019 with passive collection of urine here on this little hole. And uh, this um, here is a female uh, urinal. It's been developed by um, our colleague from the OKP program, uh, Louise Raguet. And um, I find it very interesting because it, it enables to collect the urine, of course, but it's also a very interesting object in the sense that um, there is a huge uh, discrimination between uh, male and female in the society. And the toilets is the perfect place to see the discrimination because whenever you go to the theater, you will see that uh, the men don't have to queue at all for the toilets, but there's an immense queue for the women. And that's just because, I mean, I think I didn't think about this question when I was younger, but when I started working on the question of toilets, I just discovered that it's not, it's not um, uh, something that is a necessity. It's just because public spaces have been thought for and made by males and made more convenient for, for, for males, uh, whereas it's totally possible to conceive a toilet that would be um, as, uh, uh, as um, efficient and, uh, and, and best working for, for women uh, as it is today for, for men. Um, there's also a, a huge um, uh, research and uh, development activity on products that you can make from urine. So uh, the, the first product that was developed uh, by the Swiss uh, researchers, uh, the public Swiss institution called the EAVAG, was a, a process of, a, is a process of a urine concentration. Um, and it's already be, uh, on the market now, so you can buy concentrated urine uh, today. Uh, uh, as, a, as a product and use it as a fertilizer. And there's uh, plenty of other products that, that are being developed at the moment, but not yet at the stage of being a concentrated fertilizer as this uh, as the Swiss uh, um, EAVAG institution has, uh, has developed. Um, now, um, how can we, uh, how can we, uh, uh, change this uh, this situation uh, about human excreta management. I don't know if you are familiar with the question of socio-technical lock-in. Uh, is it something you've studied already in the EPOG master? Yeah. Okay. So you know this uh, this graph I'm showing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I see people nodding. Yes. No. Ah. No. 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 You're not. You're not you're saying no. no. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, so uh, what does it mean, socio-technical lock-in? Um, if uh, that's something uh, uh, mostly uh, theorized by a person called uh, uh, Rils. Rils. Uh, it, he's, uh, he's from the Netherlands. Uh, it's spelled G-E-E-L-S. It's gonna, uh, yeah, you can see it on the slide here. Uh, Rils. So what does Rils said? He said, uh, there is a strong link between technical and social aspects of a way that a human community works. And as soon as a society chooses a technical way of having something that works, then you will have some kind of locking that happens. And it brings what he calls socio-technical regimes. So what is a socio-technical regime? It's when a society starts to work in one way, then everything locks around this way of working. So for example, using a car in France is a socio-technical locking around the way of using car. It's very difficult to do elsewise than using a car if you want to go from one place to another. And um, everything is, is uh, making it easy to, to drive with a car, even if you want to shift to something else, it's making it's very difficult. Um, and it's the case, of course, for human excreta management with the sewer. So you have um, uh, both uh, the cultures of people, the infrastructures, the technologies, the industrial networks, the, the regulations, the economic models, everything is just uh, organized so as to work in this way. And it makes it very difficult to change because it holds on very well uh, to this way of, of making. Now, the two, two things that can challenge a socio-technical regime, and that's the broad question that we have to tackle with uh, the global disaster we are uh, facing. And I think for the EPOG master, it's one of your huge question is how can we unlock these socio-technical uh, regimes? And there are two ways that we can uh, change them. The first one is what we can call landscape uh, shifts. Landscape shift is, is when the boundary conditions are changing. So if, if, for example, there is no water because there's a drought, 
uh, which happened in France, for example, last summer. Well, then the socio-technical regime of the flush toilet just doesn't work anymore because there's just no water. So that's the kind of landscape change. If the conditions change, then the socio-technical regime just doesn't work anymore. And the other uh, way that it can be uh, challenged is uh, with the niche, with the technological niche. So if other ways of, uh, of, um, of working start to appear, they're going to challenge the actors, they're going to disrupt the system. And that's the kind of thing that can make the socio-technical regime change. And if there is both a change at the, at the niche level and at the landscape level, then you are, uh, it's, it's possible that you will um, have a, a socio-technical uh, shift and transition towards a, towards a new uh, socio-technical regime. And I was attending um, in February at an international workshop on uh, urban wastewater management. And uh, Christian Bins, who was the, the, from Eavag, who was uh, organizing this, uh, this event, uh, he, um, he said that he, his, his uh, impression was that we, we were here at the moment. So there's a lot of niche of actors who are trying to challenge the, the current uh, organization of wastewater management, this current uh, centralized sewer-based uh, management of, of uh, wastewater and human excreta. And that these uh, niche are possibly, uh, we are possibly facing the fact that they will disrupt the, the socio-technical regime that is currently dominant. But of course, uh, nobody knows the future and uh, uh, we'll, we'll have to see what happens in the future. But at least the unsustainability of the current regime is, is quite clear uh, now for the moment. So in, in OKP uh, Action Research Program, what, what, is our, what is our strategy so that we can contribute uh, to try to change uh, this uh, the system, I, I will quote seven of the of the ways that we act and that we hope uh, give uh, possibilities to to challenge the system. Uh, first, uh, we conduct research in a transdisciplinary and systemic approach. Um, when I started doing some research in 2013, uh, as I mentioned before, I was not working as a, as a researcher. It was quite natural for me to to embrace a systemic view on the question because I mean I don't see how people can how we can tackle the question of socio-ecological transition if we don't combine an, a social analysis and a, and a, and a biophysical analysis of the problem, and it was quite natural. But in fact, in many cases, research is conducted quite differently between purely technical um, analysis and purely sociological analysis. And it's it's I think it's really something very important to do if we want to have systemic approaches of the problem to uh, uh, try to make bridges of trans transdisciplinary approaches of our of our issues, which which means that there's a, a need for for strong uh, changes in the way that research is conducted at the moment. Um, we also try to in identify and to create places for exchanging with non-academic actors. And this link between research and uh, other stakeholders is something that I think is very powerful at the moment because researchers have the possibility to invent, to uh, think of changes uh, that they have less constraints than, than the other stakeholders in terms of what they can, uh, what they can um, uh, propose uh, as new ways of, of, uh, of living. And it's what we desperately need at the moment, radical changes, ideas of radical change. So we need to be uh, to have this um, fertilization uh, that goes in the two direction because we also researchers also need that the stakeholders to share with the stakeholders their constraints so as to orientate the research in, in, in the best direction. So I'm quoting here some of the, the, the actors we are interacting with. Uh, I mentioned already the, the um, Ecological Sanitation Network, but there's also Pierre Hensen, Asté, Arceau Ile de France, uh, notably, uh, and Circus, with which we uh, interact. Um, maybe I'd like to quote um, a notion um, uh, that is important in, uh, in social science. I don't know how to translate it in English. In French, we, we say uh, um, les, uh, an actor qui est marginal séquent. So I would try to translate it with marginal second actor, but I don't think it's a good translation in English. Uh, what does it mean? It means that if you want to be, build bridges between research and uh, an action or stakeholders uh, that are not in the research sector, you will need people who are able to talk to both worlds. 
and that kind of people are not so uh, uh, are not necessarily um, you will not find it so often. And uh, uh, in in the case, for example, of the of the the story of wastewater um, uh, reanalysis that I mentioned in OKP program, it was helped a lot by uh, some people who had the ability both. Uh, from the wastewater author utility uh, authority uh, that had uh, that were used to working with researchers and at the same time researchers that were used to talking with stakeholders and they developed a common language and it enabled that they that this uh, flow of information could, could go both ways uh, so as not to have a silo approach of research on one side and, and operational actors on the other. Um, our strategy is also to support and empower local actors. So we are working with a lot of communities and mostly, I mean, uh, particularly uh, big cities like Paris and Lyon, but also uh, smaller uh, collectives all around uh, France. Uh, and we produce a lot of documents. Uh, so as the actors are mostly in French, in French but some are in English. Uh, so as uh, everybody can can grasp this uh, possibility of changing uh, management of, uh, of human excreta. We develop prospective approaches, which I already mentioned, and I believe uh, I believe these scenarios are, are, are of something very important that uh, research needs to produce, um, make a, a biophysical uh, uh, analysis of what is possible, and uh, then make it possible to have a political debate about what is desirable and um, that is what we are for example doing with the scenario mentioned by by Gilles Bilen and, and, and colleagues for the shift in agriculture in uh, in Europe we are also working a lot on on what we call weak sig signals so that's all the small initiatives that are taking place at the moment and as researchers, we are making an enormous focus on very small initiatives, but I think it's something that we need at the moment because these weak, weak signals uh, need to be given more power so that they can develop because they possibly uh, represent what uh, is the sustainable future way of managing uh, our human excreta uh, for tomorrow. And um, we are trying to, to, to focus as much as possible in these, uh, in these um, uh, new systems. Um, and we also make these new situations emerge ourselves. Um, so um, we demonstrated the use of human urine as a fertilizer on, on fields uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Saclay, as you can see on the picture here. And then when we had fertilizers the, fertilized the wheat, um, our co my, my colleagues from the Agricultural Agronomic Institute did not intend to do anything special with the wheat, but we said, okay, now that we have this wheat fertilized with urine, we need to do something with it. So we, we found a, a baker who said he would be glad to bake some bread made of uh, wheat fertilized with urine. And then we did a lot of um, events where we, and we still do, where we share bread or we cook biscuits. Uh, that are made uh, with this wheat, uh, with the flour uh, made from the wheat, uh, spe uh, specially fertilized with, with urine. Um, and uh, one of our projects, two, two of our projects on the topic is the project Colos uh, in, uh, in Lyon, uh, where, we, uh, where we try to develop demonstrators about uh, urine fertilizing, and Enville, where uh, we are supporting a community scale urine diversion, uh, diversion uh, program. Uh, in Paris, um, so it's people who decide to stop using their flush toilet in their flat and um, and start to collect their urine, and then they organize themselves with farmers so that they can bring it to the farm. And this is something that we um, did in Paris, uh, inspired by uh, an initiative in North America called the Rich Earth Institute, that is developing that kind of a, of a, of a transition. Um, and uh, last but not least, we are doing uh, a lot of action so that these ongoing transformation can be made tangible. Um, we uh, do workshops uh, so as people, um, as stakeholders can try to think and about how they could change the way they manage their uh, human excreta on the site. So we, we develop this kind of game where we, we give the, the people the, the game and then they, they can think about, okay, this is, these are the options. These are the other kind of toilets that we could use. Here's the way that we can manage them. This is the kind of agriculture where we could use that kind of product and so on and so forth. And uh, we also do a lot of links between uh, research and art because I believe the question of sensitivity 
in um, in socio-ecological transition is uh, is of, of, um, of paramount importance. And one of the things we developed is a uh, is, is a musical conference on the topic. Um, in fact, uh, we're gonna we're gonna do it on Monday evening. So if some of you are interested, um, it's gonna be at the Pavillon de l'eau. Um, with the association Arceau Ile de France. If some of you want to attend it, it's going to be in French, but there's also music which is international. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna talk and and, uh, and and try to make people feel sensitive about this question of how does our society work at the moment and how can we change it. And uh, that's a way for us that is very uh, important to make um, to make uh, bridges uh, between intellectual app apprehension of the question of socio-ecological transition and sensitive aspects also. So I'm sorry not to be here physically, but if, no. I, if I was there physically, I would, of course, um, offer you to eat some of the biscuits that I mentioned before, uh, but uh, maybe I can send them to David or, or, or to Pierrick so that you can uh, eat them next time. Oh, uh, I see that Gilles Bilen will come. So I will give some to Gilles Bilen so can he can give you to you when when he, when he comes. Sorry for not showing them uh, right right now. Um, and um, so yeah, um, sorry. Um, so how how um, as I mentioned before, since the question is a question of of cultural values and power relationships. How can we act so as to change uh, management of human excreta towards a sustainable management? Um, I would uh, say that we need to change our relationship to human excreta and to water. I mean, there's there's a need for a, a huge uh, cultural shift. And um, it's interesting today that in France, when we make surveys about how do people think about changing the toilet, we have both people who say it's dirty to have a dry toilet and to poo in sawdust. But we also have people who say it's dirty to, to pee and poo in drinkable water because it's just absurd. So we have a, this cultural shift is already happening uh, in France. And it's very interesting to see this, uh, this, this change in the way to, to, to um, uh, interact with our uh, excretions. We um, uh, try to demonstrate by doing uh, things at all possible scales. So I mentioned the very small scale of your own uh, small plant in your flat. And the higher scale of the of the district at the in the Paris uh, Saint Vincent Paul district. Um, there's also a big issue. We can debate about it uh, afterwards if you want, um, because there's been a lot of deployment of the northern solution in the southern countries. Uh, so, for example, it's been very well demonstrated that China uh, has been pushed uh, towards developing the same uh, wastewater and sewer management um, in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s as had been developed before in the Western countries, uh, whereas it would have been possible to reinvent other solutions that China had, was already implementing at that time. But uh, there has been a, a enough power from the uh, Western countries so that to, to promote the same development in northern and southern countries that were de developed before in the north. And I think that there is now a huge uh, innovation taking part, uh, and notably on human excreta management, in uh, in southern country that should ins inspire the way that northern country uh, uh, can today shift in the the management of human excreta. And um, uh, of course, when we talk about uh, strategies for change, uh, I will mention these three main strategies that one can think about. So the first is what I call the interstitial strategy. So it's the idea that you can make small changes, small patches of, of communities that do something elsewise and then just hope that it will diffuse and grow bigger so that it changes the whole system. There's of course the reformist um, uh, strategy that uh, hopes to change the laws, change the regulations so that uh, it will enable our society to shift globally. This um, uh, 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 and the last strategy is the revolutionary strategy. So it's the strategy of a global uh, abrupt change. Um, I personally don't know which is the right strategy because none of these have worked in the past 70 years, whereas it's already been 70 years that people have acknowledged that we need a global shift. Um, so I personally think that we need to try and do the three at the same time if we want to maximize the change. Uh, the, the chances that, uh, that we will bring uh, some change. And of course, I mean, all three uh, can combine together 
so as to 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 maximize uh, uh, these changes as as I, as I just said. So uh, as a conclusion, uh, I mean conclusion of my uh, slides, but not of the of the lesson. We still have um, three quarters of an hour, of an hour to to discuss together. I'll be glad to have this discuss, discussion. Um, so um, the combined management of wastewater and human excreta uh, is likely to be a historical parenthesis that we are now in the Western world, but it is possibly uh, being starting to close in the coming years. But it still faces a, a huge socio-technical locking and a, a high uh, path dependency because that's the path is being taken for the last century. Um, and the, the deployment of sustainable uh, system is globally hindered by our cultural values of industrial societies, uh, fight against and destruction of life, competition, extractivism, uh, which are uh, very much opposed to this cooperation that is needed uh, for a, a, a true socio-technical, uh, socio-ecological transition. And um, uh, we are trying to work on multi-level strategies uh, uh, and empower the, the communities that are for the moment quite small, but uh, that have uh, hopefully the chance to trigger uh, a true uh, uh, socio-ecological uh, uh, transition. So thank you for your attention. And um, I am um, totally available for uh, pursuing uh, this discussion with and debate with you about uh, about these the issues that we are working on in OKP program and how they interact with what you are working on in uh, EPOG Master. So thank, uh, thanks to you. <laughs> So I, I I saw you that you were uh, applauding, but I cannot okay. hear. So Pierrick, I, I don't know if the microphone is on. Can, we we have the microphone. Yeah. So. Okay. I can okay. only hear the it microphone, works. not the not the rest. Okay. Hi, I'm I'm Max from Germany, and uh, I wanted to ask, uh, because like just as a kind of counter question, um, what were the reasons for the last shift in cultural values? Because obviously, end of the 19th century, people were discussing these proposals. Mm. Uh, it was uh, being implemented, like the, the, the human waste recycling. Like, what was the, the shift in cultural values that made us so disgusted, so afraid um, of, of our own excrement? How did we lose sight of the shit? Mm. It's a, it's a very good question. Um, in fact, the relationship towards human excreta has always been ambiguous. Uh, in particular, because uh, fecal matter uh, can transmit diseases, so uh, typhoid, cholera, uh, gastroenteritis, and so on. So there has always been an ambiguous relationship towards human excreta, because there are also uh, matters that can bring uh, diseases. So um, uh, this has made it always uh, um, difficult for the topic of human excreta uh, management to be... Um, monolithic management in and so even in the 19th century um even uh, even if these matters were considered as as precious matters um you still had this um this uh, um apprehension of a risk uh, uh, towards this this matter and what i think is the main shift is three um three changes the first one is industrialization the second is urbanization and they go together and the third one is uh, hygienism. So they all, all three went together in the 19th century. So they, they, before the people were connected to the farm, I mean, most of the population was living on farmland. So people knew that uh, human urine and fecal matter were fertilizers. They were using, uh, they were using the, the, the fertilizer, the, the, the excreta from the cows, from the pigs, from the animals. And, uh, since the population shifted towards the cities, then you had a, a population that was not connected anymore to the soil, that was not connected anymore to these cycles. So people gradually began, started to be, uh, uh, that, that's the way when you started to have a divide. I mean, how do you distinguish someone from the countryside and someone from the city? Well, the countries, the people from the countryside, you know, they are the dirty people. And the, the people from the city, they are the, the fancy and, and, and um, and clean people. And so human and fecal matter, they were representing this dirt uh, also. And it's so uh, it, 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 it facilitated, facilitated the, the fact that it would be considered as something that is um, negative, that has to be uh, discharged, taken away from, from the view. 
And then the, 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 the last and, and terrible uh, aspect was hygiene, because uh, there were uh, diseases with cholera, especially in the 19th century, due to uh, poor management of fecal matter. And the solution that was found is put everything in the sewer and take it out of the city. So the problem is just displaced to another community because then the, the river is polluted, but the community has, has uh, solved the problem for itself. And this is, I mean, a tragedy because everybody on the planet is doing the same thing. I mean, not everybody, but all the, all the communities that have the sewer, they are just displacing the problem to the others. And I think we are facing the same problem with greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, I'm consuming um, uh, oil, burning in, in a car, in a plane or whatever you like. And then I just displace the problem by putting the greenhouse gas uh, in the air. And then the problem is, is, is public and not, uh, not um, uh, my problem anymore. Um, I, I like to quote this, um, this uh, sticker I, I saw in the United States. I was in the US uh, three weeks ago because I was invited by the Richard Institute. I try not to take the plane. It was the first time in 10 years that I was taking it, but uh, I thought it was, uh, it, it was um, worth it. Uh, to to uh, because I was invited invited as, as keynote speaker for this conference and um, I saw a sticker uh, mentioning uh, Yimbi so Yimbi is the opposite of Nimbi you know the Nimbi not in my backyard uh, and so here it was Yimbi it was people who said yes I mean, I want to assume my human excreta I want to compose them in my backyard and uh, I, I think I mean the Nimbi uh, trend was very strong. Uh, I mean, you just want to evacuate things and not, not be responsible for them. Whereas people now are trying to uh, change this relationship by, okay, we, we need to assume uh, the impact on our environment. And this changes also uh, our, our daily lives and what we consider clean and what we consider dirty. And that's one of the things that we are going to have to shift uh, because uh, in, in the 20th century, um, human excreta started to be considered as dirty. Uh, whereas the, it was not considered dirty a one century ago, and that's the kind of shift that we were we are going to need. Okay, so um, I have one and a half questions. Yeah. Uh, question number one is particularly um, concerning uh, nitrogen in yes. um, the ground and water, and that is for how long. Uh, does nitrogen stay in the mm -hmm. water and in the ground? Because uh, you said closer to the beginning of the presentation that we are, we practically reached the new geological era with the amount of nitrogen that has been put in the um, in the ground. And I see this shift of treatment of human ex excreta to uh, help us stop the amount of nitrogen we put mm -hmm. in the earth. But um, for how long will the nitrogen that we already put there, for how long would it stay there? Yeah. And the um, half question is, uh, as you know, Christmas is approaching and those little excreta plushies are just uh, incredibly adorable. Are they in the market somewhere? <laughs> uh, do you have access to the chat? Or I mean, it's just Sweden Toys, the company. I, I can write it in the chat, but I don't know if you see the chat. So I, I bought them at the company called Sweden Toys. <laughs> so you can buy them for Christmas <laughs> at Sweden Toys. Um, uh, I I love them, indeed, and I I offered them to the to the people from the jury of my of my thesis <laughs> as a as a recognition for the the help to to help me work on the topic. Um, uh, I I believe I I'll need to to make a partnership with with Sweden Toys if I'm such a promoter of these <laughs> precious. I love them also. Um, for your first question, um, nitrogen. Um, uh, the, the 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 time lapse of nitrogen in the environment uh, will very much depend on the type of ecosystem you are facing. So usually nitrogen will be the input will be a fertilizer on the on the on the ground, and then uh, the excessive amount of nitrogen will infiltrate in the groundwater. Now you have some places where the groundwater just directly goes to the river or to the sea. So that's, for example, what we call the karstic uh, regions. So one of the best examples of the karstic region is the region called karst, uh, that is between Slovenia and Croatia. So there, I mean, you put the nitrogen and then it goes directly to the to the river, and in the river it will be it will be um, 
uh, used by the algae that will grow. It will possibly kill the river. Uh, but if you stop uh, uh, putting the nitrogen on the, on the on the ground, then you stop the pollution of the river. And I mean, in a few years, uh, the the river will recover, and uh, and you, you have this possibility of recovering. Well, for example, if you look at the Baltic Sea. That is considered kind of a dead sea now because there's been so much nitrogen. I don't know what is the, the number of years necessary for recovery, because even if we, if we stopped all the nitrogen leached to the to the Baltic Sea, since all the fish had have died, I believe it's gonna be it's gonna take a long time bef before you have another fish population coming back again to the to the Baltic Sea. But then you have other groundwater systems where the groundwater will take um, ages before it reaches uh, the rivers. So for example, there are places where it's more it's more a 50, 50 years uh, pace that you need before you can say that you have recovered uh, your system in terms of nitrogen contamination. So it really depends on the on the systems, but I would say it's usually a question of at least uh, uh, decades uh, before you can uh, think about uh, recovery. Hello. Um... I was I was wondering um, since how easy is it anywhere in the world to transition away from this Haba Bosch uh, society I would call it that because mm. I imagine that in Europe and China I know that there's fairly fertile grounds by itself but then when we look to other regions on the earth for example Brazil that usually has um, less fertile grounds and that are very reliant on importing lots of fertilizer to produce agricultural products is it just as easy there as well to implement like a more circular uh, nitrogen um, agriculture or and especially when we consider that a lot of these countries are also highly reliant on exporting uh, mm -hmm. food products to other countries so basically uh, exporting the nitrogen away mm -hmm. where it is not needed anymore so how would the transition look like for these regions on earth mm. i would say not having the uh Haberbosch nitrogen fertilizer use is a huge opportunity <laughs> to step away from this the, from this agriculture and go directly to a sustainable agriculture so we have a, one example uh that is the the island of cuba Cuba in the 1970s, is it? If I'm not mistaken, uh, when there was this ban on on uh, on uh, the possibility of using fossil fuels, the the, the island shifted towards nearly 100% organic agriculture, and it made a demonstration of the feasibility of it. So there is, I mean, there is technical possibility of cultivating in most countries without at all any nitrogen fertilizers. Um, there is usually uh, much less detrimental effects in terms of environment and uh, uh, in terms of contamination. So the the the, the main uh, problem is 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 not a problem of technical possibility of cultivating without Abebosch process. The main problem is a problem of of actors uh, that uh, I mean the system of actors today that uh that enforce this um this uh, this Haberbosch uh industrial agriculture uh, at the moment um I i'll take the example of the um, of the how is it called in, in english sorry uh, organisation mondiale du commerce so uh world wto thank you what? world trade organization thank you um so uh Today on Earth, you have one billion people who are manual farmers. So they 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 use only manual tools to farm the soil. When you have only a manual tool to farm the soil, you have very low uh, uh, production. But you have enough production to feed yourself and your family. And most of the manual agricultures, what they do is that they feed themselves with their own production. And they have a little bit excess of production that they can sell on the market. And with this, they can buy material for building their houses, uh, for having tools for agriculture, and so on and so forth. What does the WHO constraints do? In the rich countries using Haberbosch process, nitrogen, and so on, the production of, of, uh, of food per person is 2,000 times bigger. So one farmer in France 
produces 2,000 times more food than one uh, a manual farmer uh, in a country of the South. So what sh should we do? We should make it impossible for the French farmer to sell this wheat that he produces in a country where the, where the, the, the productivity is 2,000 times uh, uh, smaller, because even if there is a 10, 10, time, di uh, 10 time difference of, of uh, GDP, even if, if the country is 10 times uh, poorer, with a 2,000 difference rate of the productivity, it's still possible to make uh, French wheat cheaper than what the wheat will be produced by this, by this manual farmer. So what does the WTO does? The WTO says you are not allowed to have uh, taxes on importation of the Western wheat that is produced with this industrial uh, system. So then what is happening at the moment and it's been happening for the last decades is that the farmers who are uh, living with their manual tools, they produce a little bit of surplus that they can sell on the market. And with this, they can buy the, the, the houses, as I said, and all things. And since WTO, is uh, enforcing uh, the absence of tax on the importation of uh, industrially produced uh, uh, food. Then the, the farmer, the manual farmer, arrives on the market with his surplus and he cannot sell it anymore because it's much too expensive on the local uh, uh, market compared to what the Western world can uh, produce with these uh, machinery that is 2,000 times more efficient. And so uh, the manual farmer cannot eat anymore with his production. So then he migrates to a city, which becomes a, a city with a lot of people with a large uh, rural exodus and, and people coming to the city because they cannot feed themselves anymore. And then, I mean, you have the, the slums that we have now uh, um, uh, in so many places in the world that are totally linked with this commercial uh, regulation of uh, food production. And this is very well explained in the book by, um, by uh, uh, Mazoyer and Roudard, so it's in French, I don't know if it's been translated, History of the, of the Agriculturals of the World. And uh, here you see that, I mean, the, the, the best trigger that we can implement at the moment is when countries already have sustainable uh, uh, agricultural practices, just stop, uh, uh, make, you, we need to make huge taxes on the food that would be imported from countries that are using this industrial uh, processes. And as long as the, the Western countries impose through WTO that there will be no taxes on the exportation of this, this food that is produced with so much pollution and, and uh, pesticides and, and fertilizers and so on and so forth, then, uh, I mean, we are, we are doomed with these, this, these, these manual agricultural farmers that are becoming poorer and that cannot sustain themselves, whereas possibly the system is just working fine. And 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 I mean, there are also problems with manual agriculture. I, I will not say that it's hundred percent perfect, but I mean, it, it's one of the, the 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 one of the big issues that we have uh, uh, to deal with. Thank you. You're welcome. Concerning the, um, the idea of um, tax-free, uh, of the, the problem with the, um, taxing um, um, industrial polluting agriculture, that, mm. uh, just segueing from that, um, how would you uh, balance the, um, the need to have a affordable food for a lot of people and the and in its, in this case the environmental impact that that food would uh, would imply because I think it's a very uh, sensitive topic to well legislate upon um, because if food gets a bit more expensive that can mean a lot of people are not able to eat as much as they as they should. Yeah, well, I'm talking about uh, uh, taxing I importation of food. I mean, what we need to have is that having all countries being as, as much as possible autonomous in the production of food, in which case, I mean, the, the food product produced in the country will just turn into the economy of people feeding themselves 
uh, inside the country mostly and not rely on, on these uh, uh, imports. In France, there is, I mean, not only in France, but I know the case of France, there is a, a very um, interesting uh, political proposal that is called um, uh, food uh, social security. So we know um, uh, health uh, social security. So in France and in many countries, people pay um, uh, 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 based on their salary an amount of money to uh, to the social security for health. And when you are ill, even I mean, whatever your level of salary, you have access in France to the hospital. You have access to a doctor, and this is paid by the by the global. Uh, um, uh, system of uh, health, uh, human uh, of uh, social health uh, security. So the the the, the political proposal of um, uh, that is made is um, uh, is food uh, social security. So it means in a country you could have everybody, uh, depending on its wealth, that will give money to uh, this uh, food uh, social security. If you are very rich, then you'll pay a lot of money to this social social security. Um, uh, uh, food, food, uh, uh, social security, and if you are poor, you will pay nearly nothing. And then everybody has the right to have access to a sufficient amount of food uh, uh, to be nourished. And then, if you want to buy, I don't know, if you're in France and you want to buy a coconut, then you'll just buy it with your own money. <laughs> uh, uh, if you want to buy a steak that was uh, made in Brazil and imported to France, then you'll buy it with your own money. Um, but I mean the the food social security in France it has been uh, it has been evaluated and it could feed uh, I mean everybody and it, and it could um, um, uh, manage a problem today that you have many people in France who don't have access to a good uh, quality of food uh, because of a problem of price and this could could uh, could make it work I am not as well familiar of the context of um, uh, non-industrial countries of the south. Uh, I, I work more in the context of Western countries, so I know this example of food security, food uh, social security in France. But I, I'm quite convinced that this food uh, social security system could be uh, developed also in a, in a, in other contexts. And um, and of course, um, using human excreta as a fertilizer is also a means that I think could be very very useful in many contexts. So it's something that is done in many countries, but usually at small scale. And I think learning from using human excreta as a fertilizer is something that can enhance, enhance uh, environmental uh, uh, problems. If water is polluted by human excreta, you can stop it. It can, um, uh, uh, if you produce, if you use it to fertilize, then you produce more food. So people will have more to eat and have more health also. So usually um, bad management of human excreta is something that is, um, uh, 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 a, a true, uh, I mean, a multiple um, aspect problem with both health, environment, and food uh, security being at, at stake. And if you manage them correctly um, and use it, use them at fertil as fertilizers, then you can be autonomous in your fertilization and produce also more and more food for the population. So, uh, so I mean, I, I we we did um, analysis at the hu European scale um, uh, food system, as I mentioned before, uh, but it's also something that I'm I'm convinced could be deployed at at all country scale also. Thank you, Fabien. I don't know if there are any other questions. Um, yes. I just want to follow up on what Celso was saying about uh, the question of autonomy mm -hmm. and to the example of a, I don't know, semi-industrialized country that comes to mind in my country in the 1970s when there was a big food shortage, mm -hmm. the solution, the only way to reduce dependence on U.S. imports of wheat, because at that time India was closer to the USSR, was the green revolution it was mm -hmm. industrial agriculture so i think that establishing food autonomy for countries of the global south is not that simple in the sense that just by shutting off imports can we achieve self-sufficiency i don't know maybe it differs from country to country but mm -hmm. I think that's not generalizable because in that case also often the solution is industrialization. At that time it was both uh, fertilizers and chemical fertilizers as well as uh, 
genetically modified high yield varieties of rice mm -hmm. and that has had the same kind of ecological consequences but the alternative would have been to be dependent on wheat imports so that's another half of the problem that um, it, the, the solution I think does not transfer automatically it's something that one has to work on simultaneously mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's really a debate you're going to have with Gilles Bilen that's going to be great because he's, he's much more into these topics than I am. Um, what I would like to say is, of course, one very important criteria is the density of population. I mean, how much uh, land is there to cultivate and how many people are there on this land? I mean, when the ratio is, is very high, uh, which I believe is the case in India or in China, there's a very small cultural land compared to the people, of course. Uh, the production, the, the the question of autonomy makes it difficult. It's the case also for Northern Africa, Egypt, for example. I mean, the, in, there's not enough space uh, to cultivate uh, as compared to the number of person uh, on site. So there needs to be some importation. So what we did in a, what uh, Gilles Bilen did in a, in a paper published in 2015, I think, was um, to evaluate the possibility of autonomy for each country and uh, max minimize the international trade and maximize the autonomy of each country. And in, in this uh, work, so there was zero um, industrial um, uh, fertilizers used for all countries. And uh, there were some countries, so I don't know exactly where India was located, but there were some countries that still needed uh, more food than what they were able to produ produce, but there were other countries that produced more, and so it was possible to have a trade-off between everybody, and uh, uh, and with and without any country on, in the world using industrial fertilizers. But of course, there are some countries where where the question of land land uh, agricultural land versus population makes it nearly impossible to uh, to to uh, to have a, a food autonomy at the moment, and uh, and well, that's. I mean, that's a big issue. I mean, China decided to, to, to have a policy on the number of births uh, in the country, uh, uh, also due to this to this question. And I, I like the um, I like the the analysis by uh, Laurent Mesmer. He 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 was a, a former uh, manager of the masters in France about uh, uh, sustainable uh, policies, and 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 he's deceased now. But he he was saying that um, there are not so many levers that we can act on. I mean. Uh, there's the level of how much how much human population do we have? There is the level of um, what is the state of Earth we're going to have? I mean, how much livable is planet Earth uh, going to be? Uh, what level of comfort do we uh, do we have? Um, and and what is the efficiency of the techniques that we are using? I mean, and there's no other way that we can act on the problem. Usually. You, have, you will have people who will uh, say, okay, it's a problem of uh, overpopulation, or okay, it's a problem of, uh, of bad efficiency of the techniques. But in fact, there's only four parameters that we can act on. And if you only act on three of them, then it's the last one that will pose a problem. And you, if you only act on one of them, then I mean, you, you, you have a problem with the three others. So, I mean, the, if, you, if you look at the technical aspect of the problem, then I mean, it's it's bounded by by these four questions, and um, if if you if you want to to work only on two or three of them, then the fourth one will be the the one that will pose a problem. So uh, so yeah, then I mean you have to look at each country separately and analyze how its uh, sy uh, food system works, how the excreta is managed also uh, in this country, and then. Uh, yeah, you see which of the four levels you want to act on if you want to implement a sustainable uh, 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 management. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay.